Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to Bear Creek Council Living with Wildlife Series. Today, we're going to be talking about bears. My name is Greg Albrechtson, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's call and today's live presentation. Um, before we begin, just would like to give you guys uh, and folks a little bit of a background on, on who uh, Bear Creek Council is. So Bear Creek Council is a grassroots environmental organization based here in Gardner, Montana. And we've been operating here for over 34 years. Things that we do in the community is everything ranging from uh, helping protect our natural resources, education, uh, protecting our waterways, protecting mining interests. Uh, other things that we do to give back to the community is we help support activities such as putting solar panels on, on schools, uh, help provide bear container boxes, which might be a, a good thing to think about for today's presentation. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'll be putting a few links up in the session for you to take a look at if you'd like to get a little bit more interest in who Bear Creek Council is, get a little bit more information on that, perhaps join the Bear Creek Council as a member and see how you can give back to the community. You're not required to live in the area, you just need to be required to be interested in the area. So with that, um, Prior to today's presentation, uh, we've already completed two items in a series of living with wildlife. We've already provided a series with wolves and another one uh, regards to cougars. So we'll be putting those links up at the end of the presentation as well for you to take a look at those. Um, this session is being recorded, so uh, you can you know, have a look at that again if you would like to. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at those. Well, without um, much further ado, I'm going to introduce today's speakers to you. Uh, we have two local experts in the area, uh, one from uh, Montana Parks, Fish and Wildlife, uh, and another one from Yellowstone as well, that will be speaking one after another. The one thing that I'd like to ask you to do is if you do have any questions, please send them along. And at the end of the presentations, we're going to have a live Q&A. Um, but rather than putting them in the chat, we'd like you to use the, the Q&A field to put those questions in, because that's where we're going to be watching and looking for those. So uh, our first speaker today is Danielle Euler. Uh, she is a wildlife stewardship outreach specialist at Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. As part of that job, she provides bear awareness information to people who live, work, and play in bear country. Before joining FWP, she worked as a park ranger on the trail crew and also as wildlife technician, a wildlife guide, and an instructor. Most recently, she's coordinated the bear information and outreach program for the Montana Bear Education Working Group. So obviously lots of, lots of information and interest here and on, on bears. She studied environmental studies and wildlife biology at the University of Montana, Growing up in the Gardner area was a catalyst for her passion to work at that intersection of humans, wildlife, and wild places. So without further ado, um, Danielle. Hi, Greg, and hi, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I just want to start by thanking everyone for joining us today. I think it shows that you care about the future of people and wildlife in your area, and that's one of the very first steps to to becoming better stewards of our landscape. So thanks to Bear Creek Council for hosting and Northern Plains Resource Council um, for, for providing us a, a forum here. Um, I also appreciate the, appreciate the opportunity to share this forum with Kerry Gunther um, because I, I can thank him for much of my formative years of learning about bears and living with bears. So it's an honor to be here today. So there's a lot to say about bears. Um, we could talk for, really days about bear biology, natural history, awareness, um, the science of studying bears, uh, their population dynamics, their legal status. There's a lot. So today we're going to focus more on the living with wildlife aspects and Carrie and I are going to split up what we're talking about based on our expertise and the work we do in and outside of Yellowstone Park. And so my areas that I'll talk about are more about living in bear country and practices that don't happen inside of the park. So uh, we'll, we'll be talking about each of those topics. And again, like Greg said, please ask questions. We'd like to hear what you're thinking and make sure this is relevant for you in the question and answer session. So first off, I wanna give you a little background about what's going on with bear populations in Montana. 
So I work statewide, so the, the entire state of Montana, and a lot has been changing in the distribution of particularly grizzly bears over the last several decades. And so one of the things I end up having, you know, an important point to talk about whenever I'm at a public presentation is just how much these dynamics are changing. There's a lot of communities in Montana where maybe they weren't used to seeing grizzly bears, but now they're getting to be more common or they're, they're, they're very common. So people's um, historical context is changing to what is, what is the reality today. So black bears are common across Montana, except they're very rare in the very northeast corner of the state. So pretty much everywhere else you could expect to see a black bear. Some places in Montana have a higher density of black bears than others based on um, the habitat type. So the densest populations in the very northwest Montana where it's, um, it's a cold rainforest basically. So grizzly bears, however, are focused in two main ecosystems in Montana the northern part of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So that's where you guys are in Gardner. Um, and then the northern continental divide ecosystem. Those are the two main areas, but it goes beyond that. So to go to the, back to those ecosystems, currently the Yellowstone, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem has about 737 grizzly bears in the area that we record their population. And that's for the states of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. Now in the north central part, of Montana around the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, including Glacier National Park, there are about a thousand grizzly bears. So those are the two main large populations. We also have the Selkirk and Cabinet Yak ecosystem. I'm sorry, the, the Cabinet Yak ecosystem, there are about 55 grizzly bears there. Northern Continental Divide and Yellowstone ecosystems are considered recovered, which um, we consider at Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks a great conservation success story. So those are the two main populations that are, that are doing really well. Now, when grizzlies were listed on the endangered species list in the 1970s, and, and the conservation plan was first written later after that, they wrote out these different um, ecosystem boundaries. The ecosystems, including GYE, NCDE, and others, are places identified as good grizzly bear habitat. The Bitterroot ecosystem is one of those, as, as well as the Northern uh, Cascades ecosystem in Washington state, but those two areas don't have a grizzly bear population yet. So just because there's an ecosystem identified doesn't mean there's necessarily grizzlies there at this moment. So that's a little background on what's going on in grizzly bear population in Montana and beyond. Generally speaking, we now say that you could see a grizzly bear anywhere west of a north-south line at Billings, Montana because even though most of our grizzly bears or the highest densities are within the ecosystems I just talked about, they actually are moving into new areas, looking for new home ranges and are, are quite active um, in areas that haven't been in the past. So we can just expect to see bears anywhere in the Western half of the state. Now, well, let's move on from that into a little bit about food storage and what gets bears in trouble and what we can do to prevent that. In Montana, we consider grizzly bears an important part of our natural heritage, and we wanna do what we can to prevent bear encounters and keep people safe. So first, assuming that bears are anywhere is a good start. I think it's a common thought, or especially like I've, I used to live in Gardner and I've lived in other areas of Montana. And I think for folks who were grizzlies and black bears aren't necessarily in town all the time, you think, oh, maybe I should only take care of my food and attractants when it's fall and the bears come into town, but really, assume they're out there anytime they're not hibernating and have all those attractants stored properly. Because preventing conflicts with bears is a lot easier than dealing with those conflicts. And so we'll talk about what those things are and how to prevent, how to prevent those conflicts. And then be prepared to handle encounters with bears, which Carrie will talk about as well. So around our homes, I think this is one of the, the biggest steps we can take is to assess the area around our homes for what could be available to bears, what they may find interesting. Bears have a sense of smell that is conservatively 700 times better than a human being. So they really see the world with their noses. Um, they like all kinds of things that could provide calories and even things that aren't calorie rich, but could smell like food. So some common ones that we see in Montana um, most commonly around people's homes are number one, garbage, could be recycling, uh, could be animal feed that has additives. So not just hay, but like grain or sweet feed, dog food, cat food, 
all of those things. Bird feeders are another huge one. And bird feeders are just are one of the most calorie rich food sources a bear can find. So best practices with bears with um, bird seed is just to take it down when the bears are uh, coming out of hibernation. In this area, usually that they start coming out of hibernation around the beginning of March. Um, and then it's progression as the different bears come out. So first adult males and other adults that don't have cubs, then females with older cubs, and then females with the youngest cubs in April and May. So generally that's the, the cycle of things. And then they're going back into the den, usually by the end of November, but, but bears hibernate because of a lack of food, not because it's cold outside, although those things are related, snow covering up and making their food availability scarce. So sometimes bears will stay out longer in places that food is available. For example, in a place that there's been a lot of hunting and then there's still carcasses on the landscape, they may stay out a little longer feeding on those carcasses. So it depends on where you live, maybe the cycle of bears in your area, but generally um, March through November is a good time to make sure all those attractants are stored away properly on your, your property, whether you're in town or you're out in the country because bears can be anywhere. So how do we store attractants properly? Well, there's a lot of easy ways to do it. It just takes a little bit of forethought. So first off, garbage are most common offender. I would say um, the best way to deal with garbage is to keep it inside of a maybe your garage or a shed until pickup day um, if you don't have access to a bear resistant garbage can. Bear resistant garbage cans are the easiest and thankfully folks like, um, like Bear Creek Council and be be bear where Gardner are offering those cans. So that's a great start. But if you don't have access, just keep it away from the bears until you take it to the dump or you, you have it out for garbage day. Even at, even as something as simple as just waiting till the morning of garbage day instead of putting it out the night before and giving the bears more time to investigate can really help. So those are some things you can do. We talked about bird feeders, pet food, easy thing just to feed your animals inside or only feed them the amount that they're gonna eat and not have extra there. Another thing we commonly see in our part of Montana, but really a lot of the state is apple trees and other fruit trees. So these can be a huge attractant for bears. Um, they're high in calories and they're, they're just, they're really irresistible. So in our current, as we're moving forward with how we, we plant trees, maybe consider if you want to have a fruit tree, if you have the time and energy to maintain it or the people living in that land in the future would do the same. Um, for your trees that are already existing, think of ways you can mitigate the ability of bears to get those food sources. So gleaning, so taking as much of, um, of the, the fruit off the tree as you can and not letting it rot on the ground. Another really easy option is to just erect an electric fence that could be temporary around your apple trees or your fruit trees to keep bears away from them. We, this is a big reason we get bears in towns in the fall in Montana. And it's true in a lot of towns, especially along uh, riverways. Bears like to travel along creeks, um, streams, rivers to get their natural food sources and then that's where our towns are located. So they're drawn up out of the, the creek bottom into other more dangerous, considering what their fate, their fate might be, dangerous situations for them. The good news is there's just so much we can do to prevent those kinds of encounters. They're pretty much unnecessary. All I can say here is it's, it's easy to see outside of yourself what people are doing wrong and, and, and um, and make judgments, but I would say it's it's harder to look at your own backyard. And if you can prevent these encounters before they happen, don't wait till there's a bear on your property getting into garbage to, to do something, do it ahead of time. So we can prevent that bear from associating people with an easy food source. So those are some things to, to consider about at home and um, preventing bear encounters around your house. Now, let's switch gears to hunting. So hunting obviously doesn't happen in, in the park. So we have a lot of hunting going on in Montana and particularly um, we have our big game season, um, our elk and deer season, archery through rifle season is a time we have um, increased conflicts in proportion to, I would say the number of people out in the woods because there are some parts about hunting that, that put us at a higher risk for having bear encounters. One of those reasons 
um, for increased risk is that fall, the time that bears are most active and getting ready for winter is the time that coincides with our big game season. So bears um, aren't as aware of their surroundings. They're more focused on food. And then we can't follow all of the same rules and suggestions that we have for how to prevent bear encounters. So Carrie will probably touch on this again, but the main things that we always recommend for people to prevent bear encounters are to be aware of your surroundings. So this is something hunters can do um, to have your wits about you to be looking for a sign like tracks and scat, um, carcasses, things like that, that might tell you a bear is in the area. We, we talk a lot about bear spray and bear spray is an excellent tool. You absolutely should carry bear spray. It's very effective, more tools in the toolbox. Even during rifle season when folks are already carrying a firearm, um, I, I also carry bear spray with me. It's very, very effective. Um, but your, your mind is also a really valuable tool. So you want to continue to be aware of your surroundings and know what's going on. Second, traveling in groups. Now, traveling in groups of three or more is the safest in bear country. Um, a lot of times hunters aren't necessarily in big groups because it's harder to sneak up on animals. So again, you're going to have to increase your awareness of the, your surroundings or do as much as you can to go with other people or at least let people know where you're gonna be and be in the same general area. Avoid traveling at dawn and dusk. So this is again, hard for hunters because kind of the golden hour for hunting for even for in just wildlife watching generally is early in the morning and late in the evening when animals are most active. So that also works for bears. So if you wanna avoid bear encounters, you avoid those times, but if you wanna be successful hunting, you may be out in the woods at that time. One thing that I can tell you, um, what I've, I've actually changed some of my personal practices based on this, um, this suggestion. Um, I had a, an encounter uh, near Gardner. I guess it wasn't an encounter, it was a sighting that could have been a close call. I was hunting not far from Gardner um, with my partner and we were hiking up in the dark during archery season to a place we thought we could find some elk. And we, we got all excited because we found a big herd of elk and we were a little too far away from them. So we had made a plan to come back the next morning and we started hiking back down the ridge that, that we'd come up in the dark. And I, my, my partner in front of me motions to me to stop and he whispers bear. And we look ahead and there's a, a huge male grizzly bear walking slowly up the hill that we had walked up in the dark. And we stop and watch him for a minute. He's a few hundred yards away. And he stops on that ridge and we realize there's a gut pile. And so we just think what would have happened if he'd already been on that gut pile when we walked up in the dark. So the lesson I learned there is to, if possible, reduce the amount of time that you're walking around in the dark. So make more of your movements in daylight or maybe even walk in somewhere and camp in a place fairly close to where you plan to hunt so you're not walking for hours in the dark and in bear country. So that's another suggestion. Um, we talked about carrying bear spray and knowing how to use it. I keep it handy at all times, hunting or not. Um, and then, you know, never run from a bear. True in, true in any season, in any circumstance, running from a bear isn't a good thing to do. Now, um, the other thing that about about hunting season is you're being really quiet. So you can't make noise like you would any other time of the year because obviously you'll startle the animals you're hunting. So this is gonna make it more likely you could run into a bear. So again, using your situational awareness as best you can. Now, if you get an animal, you're lucky enough um, to, to find what you're looking for and to kill an animal that you're, that you're legally hunting, um, then your next thought should be how do I implement the plan that I already have in place for getting the meat out of the backcountry as quick as I can? Because the more time the animal is dead on the ground in the backcountry, the more likely a bear is to find it, especially overnight. So the first thing to do is to separate the gut pile from the rest of the carcass that you plan to use. And I know there's a lot of variables in hunting season, but it's best to separate um, the gut pile downwind or where you think the predominant wind will take the smell thinking that if a bear does smell that gut pile, they're gonna come to that first rather than the meat that you plan to take out. Now, if you can't pack it all out at once, you should hang the meat that you plan to take with you away from the gut pile, if at all possible. I know circumstances don't always allow, but the other thing you can do if you have a, an animal on the ground that you can't really move is to 
plan a way when you come back that's that's safe so that you can see it from a ways away and you know that a bear hasn't messed with it. Also, when returning to a carcass, usually these are with elk because they're, they're big enough that you can't necessarily take them out in one trip. So when you're coming back, you're coming back with a bunch of people, um, you know, you're making a lot of noise uh, and you should be making noise as soon as an animal is on the ground dead because you don't want to, um, you don't want to continue to be quiet if there does happen to be a bear around. So getting the meat out of the backcountry as quickly and safely as possible is a huge priority. Um, one tip that I have from one of my coworkers um, who's hunted for many years here in this ecosystem that he does is if he can't, you know, quarter the animal out and take it if it's on the ground whole, he'll stick a stick in the rib cage of the animal. And so if a bear has come and disturbed the carcass overnight, when you come back, that probably won't look the same and that won't be in the same exact position. So it's something you can look for. You could tie some flagging on it and you could use your binoculars from a ways away when you come back to see if there's been bear activity on that area. Another thing you can do is to move it to an area where um, birds won't see it as easily because ravens are kind of the loud mouths of the, of the animal world. And if they find a carcass, they're going to be, um, depending on which raven it is um, and, and who owns the, the territory there, they might be really loud about it and other birds might be attracted and other scavengers, including bears. So they're all paying attention to their different signals and um, what's going on in the world around them. So if you can make it harder for birds with their really good eyesight and they're flying overhead for them to see, it's less likely that other predators or scavengers will find it. So those are, those are some things to consider when you're hunting in bear country. And um, if you ever come up to a carcass, like you're returning to get meat and you, have, you find a bear there, don't try to scare it away. It is not worth your safety. Just go back, um, call a game warden, explain the situation, but don't put yourself at risk because it's, not, it's just not worth it. So those are the main things to consider when you're hunting um, and things you can do to prevent negative encounters. Some other things I wanted to mention, any high speed activity, so could be mountain biking or trail running, um, that fast movement could trigger chase instincts for a bear or a mountain lion or a wolf. I'm sure the other folks who talked about living with wildlife might have mentioned this. Um, so if you have an encounter with an animal like or with a bear that that happens when you're moving fast or you're, you're running or biking, stop and get off your bike, um, use your bear spray. And basically, based on the bear's behavior, stand your ground, use your bear spray, and um, if the bear is acting defensive, um, it feels threatened, then you stand your ground, only play dead when they make contact. If the bear is acting like it thinks you're food or it's curious about you, it's not showing signs of stress, then you would stand your ground, use your bear spray, and if they make contact, you'd fight back. So a real simple way to think about it is in when bears are demonstrating um, behavior that shows that they're threatened. Um, you show calm behavior and stand your ground. When bears are showing behavior that could be curious or predatory, you're showing more um, aggression or you're trying to deter them from coming closer using your bear spray, but not playing dead. So that's a simple way to think about it. Also, a lot of us like to recreate in bear country with our dogs. And I get a lot of questions about dogs and safety in bear country. Um, a friend of mine put it best by saying that most people's dogs are not an asset in bear country. That's not to say that they couldn't help stop an encounter if you had a bear encounter, but it's super dependent on the situation, how the bear is interacting with the dog, and then also the dog itself and how it, how it reacts to the bear. So the situation we see more commonly that we don't want to happen to you is that people have dogs off leash and they're running around um, out of sight of the person and they find a bear because dogs also have great sense of smell um, and they irritate the bear barking at it or chasing it. And then they get, they get scared and they come running back to you with the bear chasing them. So that's what we wanna avoid. The best way to avoid that is to have your dog under control, either on a leash, an e-collar, or just if your dog's amazing and you have voice control, that would work too. But you have to consider if you have control. And the other part of this is stewardship. You don't want your dog out there running around and chasing wildlife because 
um, you know, the, the margin between life and death for wild animals is often pretty thin and just a one reveal to a predator by, ha by having to jump up and run from a dog could mean life or death for them. So it's best to allow them to preserve their energy and uh, act in a natural way. So those are some just some things to think about when you're in bear country, whether you're at your home, um, residence, if you're uh, visiting a place with bear that's bear country. So some of you might not be from bear country, but you plan to come here. Um, these are some things to keep in mind. Uh, also when you're hunting and also um, if you have, if you're doing any sports like mountain biking or trail running. So um, I just wanna reiterate here that, that the future of bears and their survival is up to us and um, we can take responsibility to reduce bear conflicts. So um, like I've been seeing in the comments here, if you guys have questions, please um, write them over in the Q and A section and we'll try to address as many as we can um, in our question and answer session. So thanks for your attention. And I hope this has been in valuable information for you that you can take on and pass along to friends and family. Thanks everyone. Okay, thanks, Danielle. Um, great, great talk. Uh, the one thing that I thought was really, really neat from that that I didn't even think about before was the, your friend, how they put a stick uh, in the carcass. And, I mean, that's just brilliant. It was so easy, so brilliant. I mean, it's too bad they can't patent that stick idea because I mean, it's just, you're gonna know if it's been messed with. And obviously being able to put it out somewhere visible, maybe not, you know, hang it where it's visible or put it out in the field in the shade where it's visible. But man, the, the stick is just just great. So so thanks for that. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. OK, um, so our next presenter is uh, Kerry Gunther. Uh, Kerry received his Bachelor of Science degree in biology and earth science from Northland College and his Master's of Science degree in fish and wildlife management from Montana State University. He began his career with the U.S. Forest Service working with black bears on the Superior National Forest in northern Minnesota. Uh, he also has worked with the uh, Weddell seals in Antarctica. So maybe, Carrie, we need to have another presentation on that because that sounds pretty interesting, too. Um, he's currently the bear management biologist for Yellowstone National Park and a member of the interagency grizzly bear study team for the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, he's worked in grizzly bear research, monitoring, and conflict management in Yellowstone National Park for the last 38 years. Uh, his interests include the conservation of bears and finding practical solutions for reducing human bear conflicts. So awesome, Kerry. Um, thank you. And uh, we'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks, everybody, for coming uh, or listening and watching. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of history of Yellowstone National Park because our history plays a big role in how we manage bears and bear human conflict today. So Yellowstone National Park was first established in 1872. It was our country's first national park. And it was originally set aside primarily to protect the geysers and thermal features and scenic wonders. But uh, bears were really not one of the primary considerations when the park was established. However, bears quickly became one of the primary uh, attractions for visitors uh, to the park. Pretty early in the park's history, small hotels were built up at a lot of the uh, geyser basins and thermal features, and garbage management was quite a bit different back then. Uh, people didn't worry about bears getting into their garbage, and so the, the food scraps from the hotel kitchens was just dumped right out back behind the hotels. Um, Park visitors, the early park visitors would come tour the geyser basins, come back to the hotels for dinner. Then after dinner, they'd go out uh, and watch bears feed on the garbage behind the hotels. Park management was also quite a bit different back then. Um, viewing bears feeding on garbage behind the hotels had become so popular that the National Park Service formalized the activity and built uh, uh, platforms that they called lunch counters for bears. And they would take the choices barrels of kitchen scraps and dump it on those platforms. And then we had log bleachers where uh, several hundred people could sit and watch bears feed on garbage. And we had several of these feeding stations throughout Yellowstone Park. And so a couple thousand people a night could sit and watch bears uh, feed on garbage. Uh, pretty early in the park's history, um, by the 1890s, the park superintendent was reporting that some bears uh, were highly food conditioned 
and were becoming very aggressive in trying to get humans food, human food and garbage, and they were breaking into the hotel kitchens and the tent camps uh, and causing a lot of damage. And the superintendent thought he was gonna have to remove some of the more aggressive bears to solve the problem. Uh, as early as 1910, there's reports of black bears panhandling for human food handouts uh, from park visitors traveling through the park in horse and wagon. So even before we had motorized vehicles, we had bears begging for human food. Uh, by 1915, the park opened to motorized vehicles and then visitation really started to increase and the feeding of bears also really increased and Yellowstone at that point became known as a place where you could see bears up close, you could interact with bears, you could pet bears, you could feed bears, uh, use food to lure bears into interesting positions for photographs. Um, our campground management was also quite a bit different during most of the history of the park and we didn't have bear proof garbage cans or dumpsters. And so it was a nightly occurrence that bears would come into our campgrounds and usurp people's food. Uh, and then having all these park visitors interacting so closely with park visitors also led to a lot of bear human conflict. So a lot of property damages to camping equipment, vehicles, buildings, uh, and it also led to a lot of uh, bear inflicted human injuries. So from the 1930s, when the park began keeping good records, uh, through the 1960s, we averaged 138 bear caused property damages per year in the park and 48 bear inflicted human injuries per year. So, you know, with today's lawyers and lawsuits, if we had 48 bear maulings in, in a year, uh, I'd probably be out of a job and the park would be broke pretty quick. Um, Something happened then in 1967 uh, in Glacier National Park. So Yellowstone wasn't the only bear park that was having a lot of bear human conflicts, but in 1967 in Glacier National Park, two people were killed in one night in two separate incidents by two different grizzly bears. And that was a wake up call for the National Park Service that we had to clean up the parks and make them safer uh, for people. And also we needed to make them safer for bears because by having all those bear human conflicts, a lot of bears were getting captured and killed in management actions uh, to reduce conflicts. So uh, all the bear parks uh, began writing new bear management plans. Uh, Yellowstone National Park implemented its new bear management program in 1970. Uh, basically, we closed the garbage dumps in the park where bears had been feeding. We began strictly enforcing regulations prohibiting the uh, recreational feeding of bears in the park. And we uh, implemented food storage orders so that you had to store uh, food and garbage in a manner that bears couldn't get it. Uh, and that really cleaned up the park. So we went from, like I said earlier, 48 bear inflicted human injuries per year to today uh, for the last, since 1980, we've been averaging just one bear inflicted human injury per year. And that's uh, despite uh, significantly increasing visitation, we're up over uh, 4 million visits per year now. Um, so, uh, we really cleaned up the park, both the front country and the back country injuries are pretty rare now. Uh, and I think a lot of people, um, in their minds, the risk of bear attack is a lot greater than it is. Bears certainly, uh, deserve your respect. Um, but the odds of being attacked by a bear are still pretty low. Uh, overall in Yellowstone National Park, uh, we see about one injury per 3.3 million visits. Um, but that, that statistic's not real accurate in that uh, most of our visitors never leave the front country. And so most of our visitors actually have uh, a lot lower risk of bear attack than that. Uh, so for visitors that just use the front country areas, the developments, uh, the road corridors and our boardwalk trails, the risk of being injured by a grizzly bear is about one in 63.4 million park visits. So pretty low odds. Um, for visitors that are a little more adventuresome and camp in our roadside uh, car campgrounds, uh, the risk of bear attack increases just a little bit. Uh, we see about one bear grizzly bear inflicted human injury per 27.7 million overnight stays in our uh, roadside campgrounds. For the really hardy souls that get a backcountry permit and camp in the backcountry of Yellowstone, uh, whether backpacking or uh, using horses and mules uh, or llamas, uh, the risk increases a little bit more. Uh, if you're staying in a backcountry campsite, we see about one injury per 1.7 million overnight stays. Um, and really the people at greatest risk of being injured by a bear 
are hikers, uh, day hikers or backpackers, not while they're in a campsite, but uh, while they're just hiking on the trails or in off trail areas. Uh, we see about one injury per 299,000 uh, backcountry recreation days. Uh, I guess another way to look at bear attacks is to look at uh, the number of people injured per encounter. Um, we do get backcountry users that report their encounters with bears and we see about one attack per 92 uh, backcountry encounters. But I think that uh, statistic is really biased high uh, because visitors that have an encounter where the bear just runs away are much less likely to report it than a visitor who gets charged by a bear or especially a visitor who gets injured by a bear. Uh, we figure almost 100% uh, of the injuries are probably reported to us. So I think that statistic of one attack per 92 backcountry encounters is biased uh, significantly high. And there's also probably a lot of encounters that occur in the backcountry uh, where the visitors never actually see the bear. So they don't know they had an encounter and the bear just sneaks away. So again, I think uh, benign encounters in the backcountry are probably underreported. Um, what we recommend, uh, almost all of our injuries occur in the backcountry. It's extremely rare that we ever have somebody injured in the front country. Uh, and almost all of our injuries involve grizzly bears. It's really rare for our black bears to injure anybody. So uh, like I said, we average um, between black bears and grizzly bears combined about one injury per year. Uh, and almost all of that is from grizzly bears. Um, what we recommend uh, for people while they're hiking, uh, first of all, is you wanna avoid having a bear encounter in the first place. So uh, a big thing to do is, uh, you know, remain vigilant. A lot of people, um, are probably daydreaming or they're listening to music on ear pods um, and not paying attention. Hiking in grizzly country is kind of a serious affair if you've seen what a grizzly bear can do to a person. So you really have to remain vigilant. Always be looking ahead, look to the sides, occasionally look behind you. Uh, you wanna see the bear before you surprise it. And um, you know, bears do have an incredible sense of smell as Danielle said, um, but they're also a very food driven species so especially when you get to uh, um, mid to late summer and early fall, uh, bears are concentrating significantly on just trying to gain enough calories so that they can spend the entire winter living off their fat hibernating. Um, so a bear that's really concentrating on a food source is not as wary as a lot of people think. Now, if the wind is blowing from you to the bear, that bear is gonna uh, sense, uh, he's gonna smell you and he's gonna know you're coming. But if the wind is from the bear blowing towards you, uh, that bear has lost its primary sense. So, um, you know, in humans, our eyesight is the primary sense that we use with bears, as Danielle mentioned, they have such an incredible sense of smell that their life is lived through their nose uh, more so than through their eyes. Uh, so if the wind is wrong, uh, a bear may not detect you. Um, and as far as eyesight, a bear's eyesight's about equivalent to a human. So, um, you know, figure if you can see the bear, the bear can see you. Uh, but if there's a lot of cover or something, the bear not, may not see you. So, uh, you know, the big thing is you don't want to surprise a bear. Uh, so we recommend that you make noise and blind spots. Um, you know, if you're coming over a hill or through some thick brush or uh, through um, like lodgepole regrowth, uh, make some noise. Uh, that might alert the bear to your presence so that the bear has time to move off before you come around the corner and surprise it. Um, obviously, uh, that works well for hikers in Yellowstone National Park. If you're hunting on a national forest, um, most hunters, if you're going to be a successful hunter, you, you can't really make a lot of noise. Um, another thing we recommend, uh, as Danielle mentioned, was hiking in groups of three or more. Almost all of our injuries, uh, about 80 to 90 percent of our injuries in Yellowstone National Park involve solo hikers or people hiking with just one hiking partner. Um, we, it's very rare for groups of three or more people to uh, be injured by a bear. Uh, bears respect things that are bigger than they are and that outnumber them. Uh, and some of the incidents where we've had groups of people, uh, three or more where somebody got injured, well, they weren't actually all hiking in a group. They started out together but then the faster hikers got ahead and they, uh, you know, you can quickly get spread out. So um, a good strategy is to put your slowest hiker up in front and that way you'll stay in a nice tight group. Uh, it doesn't do you any good to have four people if you're all spread a half mile 
uh, apart on the trail. So uh, that group size is really significant. Again, we see very few injuries to groups of three or more people in our backcountry. Um, we also uh, strongly encourage people to carry bear spray. Uh, there's been research in Alaska uh, that showed that bear spray was over 90% effective at stopping aggressive behavior in bears. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, a real good option to have. Now, sometimes uh, these bear encounters happen so fast that you won't have time to even get your bear spray out of the holster. Um, but it's still a good, uh, a good defensive weapon to have. Uh, we have had people injured that had bear spray. And, you know, one guy um, in Hayden Valley, uh, he said about the second that I thought bear spray and was starting to reach for it, uh, my bear, my head was in the bear's mouth. Uh, so he didn't have time. Um, people traveling by horseback almost never get injured by bears because, uh, again, bear or horses will detect uh, a bear's presence before a person will. Uh, they have better uh, sight and smell than human. And then... Um, with a horse, you can actually outrun a bear. Um, you know, horses have the agility to do that. If you're on foot, you should never run from a bear uh, because uh, you just can't outrun bears. Bears are faster than Olympic sprinters. They're faster than Olympic sprinters on steroids. So uh, running from a bear will often just trigger a chase response. Uh, we also recommend staying on maintained trails as much as possible. Uh, Bears use maintained trails. They're a lot like people. They like the easiest uh, area to travel through and our trails always have a nice grade going up the hills and everything. But bears get more used to running into people uh, on trails and um, they seem to react more defensively to encounters in off trail areas where they're not really expecting people. Uh, so in Yellowstone National Park, uh, some surveys we've done showed that about 70% of our backcountry hikers stay completely on the maintained trails. Uh, but when we look at backcountry hikers injured by bears, about 50% of the people injured by bears are hiking off trail at the time that they're injured. So um, bears definitely appear to react more aggressively towards off trail hikers. Um, some other things, um, you know, if, if you do encounter a bear, uh, we recommend that you form a tight group. So if you're with three or four people, get together in a tight group. Again, bears respect things that outnumber them and are bigger than they are. Uh, the biggest thing is, you know, don't turn and run. When I first started working in Yellowstone, a lot of people, uh, and we were actually teaching at the time that, to try to climb a tree. So people would try to run for a tree. Well, oftentimes the bear would uh, catch up to them before they made it to the tree, or they would just be starting up the tree and the bear would grab them by the ankle and pull them down. Um, so we no longer uh, teach people to try to climb trees. Uh, we recommend that you uh, slowly back away. If you have an uh, encounter with a female with cubs and you slowly back away, it puts uh, some distance between you and those cubs, which can often diffuse the situation. Uh, sometimes though, as soon as you start to move, the, the sow charges. Uh, in cases like that, you wanna then stand your ground. Um, by Just by standing your ground, that'll often stop a charge, the bear will veer off to the side or stop short. It might slap the ground, uh, pop its jaws, but uh, by standing your ground, most of the time the bear's not gonna follow through. Um, you don't really know if you're a runner or a stander until you have that first really close encounter with a female uh, bear with newborn cubs in May or June. Um, one year I had some new seasonals and we were out in uh, Hayden Valley uh, to retrieve a radio collar that had come off of one of our grizzly bears. We came over a hill and there was a sow with cubs. Uh, I had told my uh, new seasonals what to do when we were at the trailhead before we started the hike, uh, that we should just group up and slowly back away. So I'm slowly backing away from the sow. She's kind of agitated. She's popping her jaws, slapping the ground. Um, I finally get far enough that she comes down and she starts leading her cub away. So I turn to look at my seasonals and they're just sprinting down the trail. Uh, so you don't really know until you have that close encounter whether you're gonna uh, run or stand your ground. But the thing to do is stand your ground because that'll often diff diffuse the situation. Um, with bear spray, um, when the, anytime a bear is like uh, 60 feet or closer and charging, that's the time to start bear, uh, spraying your bear spray. You don't wanna to wait too long because uh, bears can sprint at about 44 feet per second. 
Uh, most encounters where, bear where bears actually charge at you occur from 20 to 30 yards or less. Uh, so bears can cover that ground, uh, you know, almost instantly. So uh, 60 feet or closer, you get the safety tab off and you just want to put up a big wall of bear spray between you and the charging bear. And if the bear comes on through that wall of bear spray, you just keep em emptying the can into the bear's face. Um, with, with bear spray, you know, it's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, so if you have a strong head headwind, it's going to get in your eyes and might put you down. If you have a, if, if there's a strong tailwind, it's going to carry further and be more effective. Um, uh, bear spray, the way it works too, it's based on the amount of head pressure in the can. So I, I know some people like to test their can before they go on hike, just one little sp spurt to uh, see if it's still working. That's not a good idea because um, most bear sprays, the average size can has about seven seconds of product, but most of that product comes out in the first two seconds. And then as the can's losing head pressure, um, you're getting less bear spray and it's not traveling out as far. It's not being shot out as far. So your first couple seconds of bear spray is your best blast. And you wanna save that for a time when a bear is actually uh, coming at you. Also, if you test your bear spray, um, you always get a little bit on the nozzle and then later you're gonna get that on a figure, finger and you're gonna rub an eye and it's gonna make your uh, life miserable. Uh, so um, I strongly recommend carrying bear spray. Don't test it ahead of time. They have pretty good quality control. I've, I've never had a new can that wasn't expired that, that failed uh, on me. Uh, bear spray expires in about four years. Uh, most bear sprays uh, have a shelf life of four years. So uh, on the side of the can in real little letters, uh, the expir expiration date will be on there. Uh, just from wear, wear and tear while it's in your holster, that expiration date's gonna rub off. Uh, so what I do is when I get a new can of bear spray, I take a Sharpie and I write the expiration date on the bottom of the can. Uh, it doesn't wear off there in the holster because it's inset a little bit at the bottom of the can. Uh, and that way you'll always know that you've got a fresh bear spray. And for me, it's just not worth carrying an expired bear spray. They still tend to work oftentimes for, you know, five, 10 years after they're expired, but I wouldn't depend on that because they could, uh, if the seal starts to fail, uh, they'll lose pressure and you don't want to be uh, wishing you had a fresh bear spray while a bear's barreling down at, at you at 44 feet per second. Uh, so again, uh, always get a, use a fresh bear spray. Um, if a bear makes contact, so say you're hiking and either you don't have bear spray or the bear comes on through the bear spray, uh, if you've surprised that bear and it's reacting defensively, once it makes contact, you just want to go passive and play dead. Uh, most of the severe injuries we get are when people fight back. Uh, most of the really minor injuries are when people just go passive, play dead, and then the bear may uh, swat them once or twice. Or, or bite them and then gather up their cubs and leave. Um, in the old days, we used to recommend that people drop a pack when they're backing away so the bear might investigate that as it charges. Well, all that did was really teach bears to bluff people out of their packs. Uh, so we recommend that people leave their pack on now. Uh, if you've had a surprise encounter with a bear, it could care less about the lunch in your pack. It's perceiving you as a, uh, a threat, uh, a threat to its cubs and it wants to neutralize that threat gather up its cubs and leave. And so by leaving your pack on, that's protecting a large part of your body. Uh, we've had people in recent years, you know, they, um, the bears make contact, it swats them a couple of times in the back, bites their back, uh, and they don't have any injuries at all. They just have this pack with these cool canine bite wounds on it, but uh, th th they come out of it untouched. So leaving your, back up, your pack on uh, can really help your back, uh, and especially for guys that hike with those old 1970s uh, frame packs, those really cover a large part of your body uh, and protect your back. Um, now, everything I just told you there is for a uh, surprise encounter where the bear's reacting defensively. Uh, and that's uh, greater than probably 99.9% .9 of our uh, injuries in the park are from surprise encounters where the bear reacts defensively. So again, in that situation, you wanna back up. If the bear charges, stand your ground and use your bear spray. If the bear makes contact, play dead. Now, occasionally it's pretty rare, but sometimes uh, you'll get a curious bear following you. Um, and with a curious bear, 
that could turn into a predatory bear if you behave wrong. So with a curious bear, you would never play dead uh, because then you're just gonna look like prey. Uh, I had a couple guys come into my office uh, one year. Uh, they were hiking through the, for the trail went through the forest, popped out into a meadow and about 60, 65 yards away, there was a grizzly bear with its head down uh, digging. The only thing they remembered was play dead. So they all just flopped on the ground. Well, the bear looked up you know, he's probably wondering why did these three guys just winter kill? The bear actually walked up and circled them, sniffing, and then walked away. Uh, so they play dead way too soon. You don't play dead until that nanosecond before the bear hits you or just after the bear hits you, then you go passive and play dead. Um, if you have a curious bear approaching you, you wanna be aggressive and you wanna tr try to run that bear off. Uh, we had a case, boy, this is probably 15 years or more ago now, uh, down in the Lake Village, uh, in the central part of the park, uh, right by the Lake Lodge. So an employee from the Lake Post Office was out jogging early in the morning. And this was, I think, uh, between 6 and 6.30 in the morning. Uh, and she was jogging and then ran into a little uh, two or three year old subadult grizzly bear. She stopped and she did almost everything right. She didn't panic. Uh, and the bear stopped what it was doing, stood up on two legs and looked at her. Well, a bear standing on two legs, that's not an aggressive posture. Uh, that's a bear, um, a, curious, a, a curious posture. The bear's trying to figure out what you are and what your intentions are. So the bear standing up looking at her, uh, she thought she shouldn't look the bear in the eye because that would be aggressive. Uh, so she looked up at the sky uh, and went into what she called the tree position, just kind of looking at the sky and hoping hoping the bear would go away. Well, the bear dropped down to all four legs, slowly walked up to her. So the surprise encounter's over. She's got a curious bear, head up, ears erect, uh, slowly walking towards her, and she remains passive. The bear comes right up to her. Uh, she can feel the breath, the bear's breath on her hands as she's looking up at the sky. Uh, she has a water bottle in her hand, so she raises her hands higher up. The bear then puts its mouth around her thigh and just slowly starts biting harder and harder. Uh, at that point, it was good she didn't panic. She realized uh, being passive um, was not working. So then she took the water bottle and she squirted the bear in the face and it let go of her thigh and ran away. Uh, so that was a case, it was a curious bear, certainly could have turned into predation if she had remained passive, but she got aggressive and uh, ran the bear off. She probably would have come out with no injury at all if she had gotten aggressive a little bit earlier. But anyway, the point is with a curious bear or a predatory bear, you wanna be aggressive, you know, fight back, use your bear spray, rock stick, whatever you have. And the, the difference between a defensive reaction and a curious predatory bear, uh, in a defensive reaction, the bear's head is gonna be held slightly low, its ears are gonna be laid back. A predatory bear is gonna come in with its head held higher, ears erect, because um, it's, it's determining whether you're prey or not. Uh, so again, defensive reaction, you want to back off, uh, stand your ground, uh, and play dead if the bear makes contact. Curious or predatory bear, you just want to be aggressive right from the start. Um, in Yellowstone Park, uh, unlike the national forests around us, we have a designated campsite system, uh, which makes it pretty easy for backcountry hikers to store their food properly. So we provide a food storage pole or a food storage locker in every backcountry campsite. So our backcountry is really mostly clean of uh, bears getting human foods. Uh, occasionally we'll get people though that don't hang everything or they hang it too close to the trunk of the, of the tree and a black bear gets it. But for the most part, uh, we make it easy and convenient for all backcountry users to store their food properly. So it's pretty rare that we have any food conditioned bears uh, raiding backcountry campsites. Uh, in our front country campgrounds, uh, we provide a food storage locker in most of the sites. We're, our intention is to get one in every campsite and every roadside campground. Uh, we currently are at about 52%. So we have almost 2,000 backcountry campsites and we still have 900 some to go uh, before we get a, a food storage locker in every campsite. But um, so if you have a campsite that doesn't have a food storage locker, then you're required to put your food into your vehicle. And we don't have problems here like in Yosemite uh, with bears breaking into vehicles. Um, once every 
10 or 15 years, we get a bear that learns that and we remove that bear so that they don't teach their cubs. And uh, it, it, you know, takes that learning out of the system so we don't have a bunch of cubs then break, that grow up to, to be car breakers. Uh, so um, our, our campgrounds overall are, are pretty safe places to be. Um, let's see, I'm not sure if I got anything else to cover from bear safety wise. Oh, I will talk a little bit about uh, bear jams. So in a place like Yellowstone Park, where we get over 4 million visits per year, uh, our bears run into a lot of people. Um, so they'll become tall. Some of our bears will become tolerant of people. Bears are behaviorally very flexible. So some of these bears that use uh, roadside meadows uh, really get habituated to the presence of people because there's hundreds of people every day. If they ran every time they saw a vehicle or a person, they'd spend their whole summer running away. So we do get habituated bears, uh, which can be kind of unnerving for people who are only used to um, wild backcountry bears that run away when they see you uh, to have a, a grizzly bear that'll stand sometimes just 10, 15, 20 yards away from a crowd of people can be unnerving. But for the most part, these bears, they've learned to live with us. And if we can prevent them from getting human food or garbage, those bears usually live out their whole life without causing any conflicts. Um, one of the problems always, always somebody wants to think, think the bear needs food and they throw food or something. And then that can set a bear on a, on a, a path of conflict for the rest of its life. Um, it, it's kind of interesting. We had uh, um, a couple of years ago, a black bear grazing grass uh, next to one of the roads in the spring because you get all the snow melt uh, and the, the, the trees are cleared along the road. So you get the first green up of grass is usually right along the road and that can attract some bears to graze in that grass. And so we had a guy that threw bread to a black bear that was grazing grass near the road. And his reasoning was when we talked to him was, well, I thought black bears were supposed to eat meat and he was grazing grass. So I thought he must be starving. So he threw it bread. Um, so uh, with these roadside bears, again, uh, we strictly enforce regulations prohibiting the feeding of bears. Um, we also uh, ask that visitors use pullouts or park completely off the road. Don't park your vehicle in the road. And then um, we don't want people obviously to approach these bears and circle the bears because sometimes you'll get a whole, everybody wants a front row view and a picture. And so all of a sudden you got to circle of people around a bear. Uh, so don't uh, approach and circle or follow these roadside bears. We sometimes see people when the bear leaves the roadside meadow and is walking into the woods, uh, we'll see people following that bear uh, to con continue to get more pictures. Uh, so we, you know, we're trying to teach our visitors better bear viewing and bear photography etiquette for these uh, habituated bears that are uh, using roadside meadows uh, for food sources. Um, and, and you know, bears, like I said, they're behaviorally flexible. Um, they're becoming habituated just because of the sheer numbers of people we have. And for those bears, uh, Oftentimes it's sub-adults or young females with cubs and, um, you know, they're avoiding the big males that might kill their cubs or avoiding wolves uh, in the backcountry. So uh, they're kind of using park visitors as a human shield because uh, a more aggressive adult males and wolves um, are less likely to be right along the road. And so if some of our roads are in really good bear habitat that's avoided by these big backcountry uh, wary bears and, and males. And so it's good habitat. And it's also uh, because uh, wary bears avoid those areas, it's kind of a, a safety zone for these young females and sub-adults. I guess with that, I think my time's right about up. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thanks, Kerry. Um, yeah, the, the numbers you gave, uh, pretty outstanding. I mean, one in 64 million and then all the way down to one in 3,000 rec days. Uh, it's really nice to have those numbers because I think, you know, a lot of people get scared to go out, but it's it's nice to know that, you know, in, with the proper, you know, forethought ahead, you know, carrying bear spray and uh, hiking in groups, you know, you can, you can have a great day in the park and, and not worry too much. Just, you know, head on a swivel, keep your head up and, and go about it. So thanks. Um, so I'd like to, uh, again, thank both presenters today. Um, thank you very much for, for your presentations. 
We're going to roll into a Q&A session now. So this will be a live Q&A. And again, if you have any questions, uh, put them into the to the Q&A box. Don't put them into the chat because um, I won't be looking there. So put them into the Q&A. And we already have uh, quite quite a list of questions coming through. Hopefully we can make it through them all. But, you know, don't don't be shy. Um, you know, put your put your questions in there. Um, so one of the first questions that, that came through is, you know, how how many bears do we have? So we've talked a lot about safety and living with bears, but you know, how many bears do we actually have uh, in, in the greater Yellowstone area, I guess, or even Yellowstone itself? I can, throw, I can uh, answer that one and just talk about our other populations in Montana too, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so the greater Yellowstone ecosystem has, it's interesting, the official count that 737, I think is the official number for 2020. It is the number we have, um, we've calculated based on uh, surveys inside of the demographic monitoring area, which is where our science team, including Carrie, monitors the grizzly bear population. However, in the Yellowstone ecosystem, grizzly bears live outside, now live outside of the DMA. So there's actually more grizzly bears than that number, but that's um, so we can compare apples to apples every year. That number shows that growth. Um, the population's higher. Uh, in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, 700 or about a thousand now. In 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 the 19 or I'm sorry, in 2004, the number for the NCDE was 765. Um, for the Yellowstone ecosystem in the 1970s, we were at fewer than 200. And and then in uh, the Cabinet Yak ecosystem which is the other ecosystem that contains grizzly bears, but they are not recovered. Um, in the 1970s, we had as few, we had fewer than 12 grizzly bears um, in that ecosystem. And they have actually had an augmentation program to bring bears in to improve the population um, of, of that area. So that's a little background on their population in each of the ecosystems. Yeah, I'll just add one thing. Um, the 737 in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is um, using a Chow 2 model that's very conservative. And we've looked at some other models, uh, integrated population model and a, a capture mark recapture and a couple others. And the other models all suggest that we're uh, over 1000 bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, the DMA, uh, within the DMA, um, about 1100 uh, to 1150 bears in the DMA. So, uh, you know, bears are hard to count and we use these different uh, statistical models. And, uh, you know, we're, the 737 is based on the most conservative model. And we're using that for delisting purposes. Uh, so we're not overestimating the population, but there's a lot of uh, evidence that we actually have likely over a thousand bears right now. Thanks. Um, so both of you mentioned um, DMA. What is DMA? Uh, this carries the the DMA is the demographic monitoring area. So we have uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service established a recovery zone where they wanted to re recover a viable population of grizzly bears, and um, we started to have bears showing up outside of the recovery zone. So then, for a lot of years, people that have been around a long time will remember we had the recovery zone plus a 10 mile radius around it. That was the area occupied by grizzly bears. Well, grizzly bears have continued to expand. Uh, so then we came up with the DMA, the demographic monitoring area. Um, and that's the area where we count cut production and grizzly bear mortalities. Well, grizzly bears keep getting ahead of us. And now grizzly bears are well outside the DMA as well. But we've kind of drawn the line at the DMA just uh, due to staff and budget challenges. We can't um, put as much effort into monitoring the bear population outside the DMA. So I have a, a follow-up question to that one, um, which uh, kind of ties into what you just went into with the DMA. So as, as um, populations increase and we have more housing and more urban development, um, obviously we're starting to, to encroach um, you know, into different aspects of you know, the different territories is there, you know, any comments? Do you, you know, do you anticipate more uh, human bear interactions in, in these areas? And, you know, maybe uh, any areas in particular for uh, locals to be heads up or? Is that, may I take that one, Carrie? Sure. Okay. Yep. 
Uh, so, uh, yeah, we are, we do expect that there will be more, way more opportunities for people and bears to, to encounter one another. And, and that's due to not only uh, the increased number of, of grizzly bears, uh, and then, you know, the, the background rate of black bears that we have, but also there are just more people moving to Montana and more of the folks moving to Montana are also moving into that interface it's not even necessarily a wilderness interface. It's an interface between um, human development and rural and open lands. So this could mean, you know, ranch lands or um, forests or, you know, national forests or private lands. And, and they're places that wildlife use. Um, private lands are a big part of the picture of wildlife conservation um, in Montana. So we're, we're going to see more opportunities for the two to in, interact. And, um, yeah. And so, yes, we anticipate that. That's why one of our big messages on bear safety is to expect bears could be anywhere and do what you can to prevent conflicts. Yeah. And in, in Yellowstone Park, you know, we don't really anticipate building more hotels or campgrounds or anything. Uh, so our job is going to be quite a bit easier than Danielle's going in the future. But the state management agencies and the education efforts uh, are really going to be critical as we go into the future with more and more people moving uh, into the ecosystem. Uh, so my job won't get that much harder, but Danielle's will. All right, thanks. Um, so I knew this question was going to come at some point, but um, you know when I'm when we're walking in bear country, um, and I see poop. Um, you know, is it easy to tell the the difference between black bear poop and uh, grizzly bear poop? So you know you've discussed a little bit about how to, you know, um, be aware of your surroundings and, you know, what you need to do when you encounter a bear, but how do I know if, uh, you know, if I'm coming upon a, a fresh steaming pile of berries or, you know, poop? Uh, I guess I'll take that one. Um, unless you have a, a swab and you can get some DNA, um, there's really no way just to look at a bear scat and say, that's a grizzly bear and that's a black bear. Uh, you could be looking at a a scat from a big adult male black bear, or it could be from a small subadult grizzly bear. So you, you can't really use size or diameter. Uh, and the size of a scat oftentimes depends on what they're eating. Uh, berries really go through bears fast. And so you'll see these huge berry scats. Uh, so really the only way to tell uh, is if there's a track associated with the scat or if you can get a DNA sample. So, so since you mentioned track, um, is it easy to tell the difference between a, a black bear and a grizzly track? Is there something, some guides you can go by? Uh, yeah, for the back tracks, both look pretty much the same. Although um, with the front tracks, uh, a black bear, the toes are more curved around the pad. Uh, so that that little toe on, the, on a black bear is going to be dropped down a lot further than on a grizzly. And then with a grizzly bear, the claw marks are quite a bit out from the end of the toes, uh, inch and a half or so. So uh, by looking at the pattern of the toes on the pad and the claws, uh, you can tell. Okay. Um, and we got a, a couple other questions and I'm gonna combine them together here. Um, so what, what about feeding wildlife and in particular, you know, that's a big subject for, for all wildlife, but uh, since we're talking about bears, you know, um, are, are there are there fines for feeding wildlife or, you know, if you do uh, continually see somebody leaving uh, food attractants out in a neighborhood where, you know, bears often visit, you know, what what kinds of people um, could we talk to to get that remedy taken care of to keep everybody safe? Um, I can answer that for Montana. So, um, first off, it's complicated. Uh, we have a statewide regulation that prohibits the feeding of wildlife in the state of Montana. Um, there are exceptions, but um, like bird feeding, but it, it's as a general rule, you're not allowed to purposely feed game animals. And bears are, um, black bears are game animals, deer, things like that. So that's against the law. If you see somebody purposely feeding wildlife in Montana, please report it. Call a game warden, call your Fish, Wildlife and Parks office because um, although folks might think they're doing things to help wildlife, what it does is habituates animals to the presence of people which endangers their lives and makes it more likely that they will transmit diseases 
amongst each other. Um, for example, I believe we just had a salmonella outbreak um, in bird feeders that were being transmitted. So just as an example, um, so feeding wildlife generally is against the rules in Montana. Now, as far as um, communities that have regulations against or require bear resistant garbage cans, it really depends on the community. For example, there is a food storage order on all of our, um, not all of our, mo all of our national forests in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And then in most of the other forests in Montana, there's regulations about how to store food. And then in some communities like Southern Gallatin County has a food storage order regulation that's actually enforceable, but it really depends on where you are um, what that specific community might have for rules and, and what you're what you what you're required to do. Yeah, I mean Thanks. Yellowstone National Park, uh, it's it's prohibited, um, and if if you get caught, uh, you'll get a citation. I don't know exactly what the fine is, um, but it's just outright prohibited in Yellowstone National Park to feed wildlife. <laughs> um, going back to another question on. Um, you know, identifying bears. Uh, now, I, I know that there's different color variations of, of black bears. Um, so within those color variations, you know, from, from a distance, even if a bear's in the shade, you know, if I'm looking through a scope or whatever, how, you know, how can I tell the difference between a grizzly bear and a black bear? Um, I can answer, Carrie and I are both <laughs> can answer this, but um, so uh, the, the best way to tell a grizzly bear apart from a black bear is by the shape of their body and looking at all the characteristics of that animal as a whole, not one specific feature. So color is not a good way to tell and size is not a good way to tell just like Carrie was talking about with the scat. Um, those are, they're not, they're not um, consistent enough to be effective. Um, so grizzly bears have a big shoulder hump. Um, that's actually just the tip of the shoulder blade muscles and um, connective tissues around that shoulder blade for their powerful digging ability. Black bears, the rump is usually the higher point on their back and they don't have significant shoulders. Um, you can see when their head is up but when they're feeding, they might show a little bit of a shoulder. Um, the face on a grizzly bear is more dish shaped. The black bear is more of a straight profile. And then the ears on a grizzly bear are small and round and black bear is kind of taller and pointier. Um, it's funny, we talk about claws. It's kind of useful to know about tracks to know that the claws are different on the two species, but most people don't get a look at the claws when they're trying to encounter a bear. So grizzly bears have long, Cur gently curved claws and black bears short, sharp claws. And I'll just put one more plug in too um, that our Fish, Wildlife and Parks bear site has a good information on bear identification, but um, all of the states that have black bear hunting that also have grizzly bears, so Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Alaska, they all have like quizzes to help you learn how to identify the species and you don't have to be a hunter to take them. So that's a good way to get to know your bear species better. Cool. Okay, thanks. So you, um... You must be reading my notes here as well. So spe speaking of uh, Alaska, um, here, you know, what is what is the largest? And I know you you probably don't weigh them, but you know, what's what's the largest bear that you know of? Like how how big is the largest bear that you know of in the area? The largest ones that we've caught in Yellowstone Park. I don't know. It might they might have some bigger ones out outside uh, the park. Uh, are between six and 700 pounds. When the Craighead, when the dumps were open and bears were feeding at the dumps, the Craighead brothers caught one that was over a thousand pounds. But since the closure of the dumps, the largest we've had is uh, over 600 pounds, but not, not breaking 700 pounds. Yeah, I would say, I don't actually have the records on that, but I would say that's about right from what I've, what I've seen and heard in Montana as well. The garbage dumps are a big, uh, factor. Oh, if bears have been feeding on grain, like getting into ranches also can have the same effect. Um, and it seems like our prairie bears are pretty big. Yeah, I think I read on uh, the east front of the Rockies, one of those bears that was eating at like uh, cattle carcass dump sites and grain. I think they got one that was just a little over 800 pounds one time. Okay, that would, that makes sense. High, high calorie foods. Wow. Um, so, so speaking of that, I, I don't know if you guys have a, an answer for this, but um, do you guys follow Fat Bear Week uh, up in Katmai at all? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great campaign that the park did. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so if, if you don't know what Fat Bear Week is, Google it, and they, they have a vote every year on uh, on the, the bears that come out of hibernation uh, up in the Katmai and, and how much they gain throughout the year. It's just kind of fun. You can vote on it at the, at the end of the year. Um, so speaking of that, it, do bears hibernate and, um, you know, do they have their kids? Do they even, you know, do their cubs, do they even know that they had a baby if they were sleeping all winter long? I mean, I can take that one if you, I don't sure. care either way, Carrie. Um, so bears have a fascinating reproductive cycle. Uh, they mate in May, June, and July. And so that's when the female technically it becomes pregnant, but it's, it's, she's kind of pregnant because the, the egg is fertilized and a zygote forms, but unlike in humans, when the zygote would implant in the uterus and, and the development would begin in a bear, it's suspended. Um, and so there's no additional energy put towards that, um, that, that soon to be a cub um, until the fall when she goes into hibernation. And I believe Carrie, isn't it? She has to have like 20% body fat to be, to get become, to have the eggs implant or the zygotes implant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so there's a little bit of variability, but primarily if, if they don't put it on a fat, they won't have the cubs. Yeah. So then if she's not healthy enough, meaning she's not fat enough to sustain the pregnancy, they'll reabsorb her. Um, but if she becomes pregnant, then they're born in late January, early February. Um, and I, I've always wondered this too. I don't know what the conscious state of consciousness is of the, of the female when she's giving birth, but I assume there has to be a little bit more activity to clean the cubs off when they're born. Um, but she's going back into hibernation. Do you have, do you know, Carrie? Yeah. Um, I don't think you can give birth without waking up. <laughs> um, and she, she'll clean the cubs and then she'll pull them in to nurse them. Um, there's been some stuff done more recently with GoPro cameras. And, uh, you know, I saw one where the female was fast asleep and the uh, two cubs were just doing circles around her in the den at, at full speed. But she does wake up periodically uh, to nurse and clean the cubs. And uh, so, yeah, she hibernation... Um, with bears, they don't go, they're a shallow hibernator, so they can wake up pretty quickly. Uh, you know, like a ground squirrel drops its body temperature almost to freezing and you could pull it out and use it as a football and it wouldn't wake up. But with a bear, uh, they can wake up pretty, pretty quickly and they do do some uh, maintaining the cubs during hibernation. Okay, um, so here's, you ready for a tough one? Here, here's, a, here's a tough question. Um, so we, we've talked about bear spray and, and how effective bear spray is. Um, and then Danielle, you talked about hunting uh, and carrying guns. Um, the national parks have recently changed their, their laws where you can have a gun in a national park. But um, I have personally witnessed, but this is not my question. It came through the, through the Q and A, uh, seeing people carrying guns on hikes and things like that. Um, would either you like to, to comment on, you know, um, the effectiveness of even having a gun versus bear spray and, you know, uh, uh, legalistically, you know, carrying a gun uh, around in the park and so forth? Well, in, in the national parks, uh, yeah, recently, um, I forget exactly what year it was, not too long ago, uh, they, they passed a law where guns were now allowed in national parks so that gun laws, as far as the carry of a gun, would be the same in a park as the surrounding state that the park was in uh, so that there wouldn't be confusion over whether you could or couldn't carry a gun. Technically, it's illegal to fire a gun in a national park. Um, we have only had one case that I know of so far. Uh, Denali had a case where a guy was charged by a bear and shot and killed it. Um, and I don't believe they press charges because of all the evidence added up to his story. Um, Glacier had a case where a bear was shot and wounded. Um, and I'm not sure what happened uh, in that one, whether the guy was cited or not. And then we had one case in Yellowstone uh, where somebody was carrying a firearm, a female with cubs who was one of those bears that uses the roadside a lot. So she was fairly familiar with people. She was just walking up the trail uh, while uh, this man and his family were standing up on the trail up the hill. He fired a warning shot over, uh, it was a female cubs over her head. Um, he was cited, uh, 
because he fired right down the trail uh, for human safety reasons. Um, so I think what the judge gave him was he had to attend a firearm safety course um, because he fired down the trail without knowing what was down there. Um, so we haven't had any bears actually shot and hit. Uh, we had a, another case where a guy was with his family and a big male bear that was fairly uh, habituated was coming down the trail. He had a, both a 45 pistol and a bear spray and he used the bear spray. So uh, we just haven't really had any incidents. I, I think if all the, uh, if the story matched the, the evidence that was found on the ground, I don't know that um, somebody would be cited for using a firearm in that situation. Um, but I'm not sure until it happens, I guess we won't know. Uh, firearms can be very effective. Uh, you, you know, we, we promote bear spray because that can usually stop the situation and you don't end up with a dead bear. Uh, but for, um, you know, firearms and people that are good with them, it's, uh, you know, an, effect, an effective means to stop a bear, a bear attack. Uh, no doubt about that. Yeah, I would just add to it, um, you know, the, we're, we're big advocates of bear spray because of many studies have shown it's very effective. One that we cite a lot from 2008, 92% of the time bear spray was used both on black bears, grizzly bears, and there were a few polar bears in the study. It changed the bear's behavior 98% of the time. Um, the people were unharmed by the bear and the people that were harmed um, were only slightly harmed. And that doesn't mean you can't get hurt by a bear if you have bear spray, but it just significantly reduces the severity of the attack. Um, so you'll, you'll get out of the situation safer. Um, there's also some, some like other concerns as far as, you know, how much people practice with different tools they have for bear protection. So I don't like to phrase it as a bears versus guns. I think it's like, um, they're all different tools to choose from and you got to use the, the best tool for the job. And there's no problem in carrying more than one of those tools if that's what you're most comfortable with. So bear spray is nice because there's no collateral damage that's long term. Um, we've had people that in trying to defend their partners, hunting buddies, um, they they were shooting at the bear and they injured or wound or killed um, their companion. So with bear spray, that is not something you have to worry about. And I can think of even in the last five years, at least two cases where people have had to spray a bear on their partner and it stopped the attack. So there's probably more than that, but those are, those are the ones I, I think of right away. So that's another benefit. And then the other thing is um, it's easy for people to learn how to use bear spray. They don't have to be um, training a lot with it or, or practicing at different kinds of targets. It's a big cone of spray that bears will run through or into, and um, it doesn't mean you have to have good aim. So that's another nice thing about bear spray. And you can teach kids um, to handle it and people who aren't comfortable with firearms. It's a great tool all around. So that's why we're such big advocates Kits. And then the other part of it is for folks like Carrie and our bear managers, like, you know, um, we don't want, we don't want unnecessary injured bears that people uh, who do bear management have to go into the field and find and risk approaching an injured bear. So that's a part that's kind of more, more personal to me um, being in this field that I, that I care about. Um, thanks. A, a follow up on that. You, you talk about um, anybody can use a bear spray, use bear spray. How, so how do you use bear spray? I mean, what's, you know, can you explain the method of how you would even use the bear spray? I know Carrie mentioned earlier on, or I think it was Carrie, about uh, 60 feet rule or whatever. But, you know, do I just point it straight at the bear and, and let her rip? Or is there any, you know, uh, you know, any guide for how I should use it? Carrie did a good job explaining. I'll just add a really simple thing here. I, I'd say don't make it too complicated for yourself. Get comfortable with taking that safety off. Spray generally downward angle at the bear when it's within range and spray until the bear changes behavior. Thanks. Yeah, you, you don't want to overthink it. Um, so yeah, just get the safety off and start spraying. If you can use hairspray, you can use bear spray. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so let's go to something a little more fun. Another question here. Um, bear rubs. Why, why do bears rub? Are they just super itchy or what? 
Well, most of the rubbing we see on rub trees uh, occurs in spring um, during the breeding season. And so we believe it's a, a way of bear, bears communicating with each other, who's out there, who's available. Uh, you know, it probably feels good too, but uh, we see it um, most often during the spring season, during the breeding season. Okay. Um, and speaking of breeding season, um, can, a, can a female bear breed with multiple males or is it just, how, how does that go down? They can breed with multiple males and they can have cubs from multiple males in one litter. They're induced ovulators. Okay. Um, and I've also heard sometimes uh, a male will try to chase off um, a, a sow's cubs during the season as well. Yeah, if, if a male um, can kill a female's cubs early enough in the spring, she might come into estrus and then he could breed her. Uh, so um, one theory is that that's why male bears kill cubs is, uh, so that they can then breed the female. Okay. All right, I'm just trying to go through the last few questions here, see if there's anything else we haven't, haven't gotten to. Um, so for me, I think that that covers it for most of the most of the Q and A. Unless uh, either of you two would would like to add anything else into the discussion. I think we covered it pretty well, and thank everybody for for showing up. Yeah. So th thanks everybody. Thanks uh, for for tuning in and uh, watching Living with Wildlife, the the Bear Edition. Um, and I encourage you to take a look into the chat. We've got some, some links on there that we'll put up for uh, some of our, our previous recordings, one with cougars, one with wolves, um, and also uh, Bear Creek Council. We'll put another link up there for that so you can check out who Bear Creek Council is and you know what we're doing with the, um, in the area here to kind of keep people safe and uh, you know keep our environment protected and keep it the way we know it. So um, with that, I think... Uh, I think we're ready to close out. So again, thanks everybody for coming. And Matt, I don't know if you have anything to add there as well, but uh, we're done. So thanks everybody. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you.